So welcome back to Garbeardia. I gotta say, uh, the newcomers from Neckbeardia say my accent's a little too heavy-handed. Has <laughs> been quite the treat. My wife's really enjoyed making fun of me about it. So thanks for that. Thanks for giving my wife more ammunition to, <laughs> to pelt me with. So uh, yeah, here's chapter six of the Veil Riders. I hope you enjoy. Yule blinked the rain out of his eyes as beads of water defied the laws of common sense, tracing down the bottom of his bill to drip onto his face. Cosmoline Company's first dragoons were stretched out in a complex ambush, watching over a road that led into the city of Emil Norris, roughly three days right away. The rain tinked off a rifle here, an M249 there. But overall, the deafening roar of the falling water drowned out whatever noise there was out beyond the trees that lined the road. Yule lifted his head ever so slightly to check out his veil riders, and heard Yethus beside him shift, looking up at him with questioning eyes. He placed his finger on his lips as the sound of rumbling engines grew in the distance. One month prior. Cosmoline Company had been dispatched by the city council of Emil Norris, under the directive of the king that ran the joint, to clear out a goblin infestation in a system of caves, which went quickly due to the miracle of fragmentation grenades. When they had gotten back to the city, Yule was granted the prize of not only a place that welcomes his troopers with open arms, but also a translation amulet, which needed blood in order to work. A rather eager female valley elf named Yethis had inserted herself into the company happily, and was to be Yule's blood supply. She was a chipper sort, her face soft and kind and framed nicely by her straw bale colored hair, which she usually wore in a long braid. With her face full of freckles, happy amber eyes, and full hips, she was, naturally, adopted quite readily into the company, and was doted on like a prized daughter by everyone but Yule and Gremlin. Gremlin believed her to be annoying, and found herself furious on multiple mornings when she would wake up to find Yethis had braided her hair as she slept. Yule thought her unwarranted affection almost draining, and found himself having to fight her to get his own food or do his own laundry. When it came to the amulet, he was warned not to use his own blood, as it could break the enchantment that was placed upon it. So Yule had to rely on this younger looking elf girl to cut herself open and drain her own original recipe into the little bottle. He didn't gel with the idea, to be frank, but he took their warning to heart. This brought the troop count to 67, and the ladies of Cosbling Company had a lovely time of rigging out the elf in their spare uniforms and found her a sidearm to use as well. Yethis could also make use of healing magic, which caused a lot of the Veil Riders to breathe easy for a change in case of boo-boos and bang-bang holes. Additionally, Gremlin managed to get in touch with Zerg Company, but not in the way she thought she would. Gremlin had run out of ways to power her drones with reliability, since the batteries took so long to charge on the solar charger, and there was no fuel to spare for the generators. To get around this, Gremlin actually came into negotiations with the harpies that lived in the city of Emil Norris. With a bit of coin and selling one of the male veil riders for their own sport, Gremlin didn't really clear it with him before, which made for an awkward company dinner when a rider was sworn by three hawk harpies. She managed to work out a deal with them to carry messages between Zerg Company and Cosmoline Company. For the first time in a long time, Coco and Yule had to write reports to each other by hand. A harpy would then take the letter and fly off with it, being dubbed the pump -a rum Delivery Service by the Veil Riders. The harpies, for one reason or another, took to the name with pride and would eagerly cry out pump -a rum when they swooped down to land nearby and deliver their packages or letters. Zerg Company had made their way to archery, a mixed town much like Ivanoris. However, they had chosen to make a small encampment on the outside of the city, while Cosling Company had made their base more or less inside the Sparkling Unicorn. Coco had convinced a few druids to help him move Earth around after seeing them practicing the craft one morning, 
in which the Vale Riders of Zerg Company made a star fort, ringed with pointed timbers, and had dubbed it Fort Kickass, Return of the Zerg. The locals of Archry adored both Coco and his riders due to their naturally charismatic nature, and the Terrans have taken to teaching the locals how to make soap. While reading the report on the day it arrived, Yul had read the bit about the soap and blinked to himself a few times. That's actually a pretty good idea. Hey Cole, do you know how to make soap? The slice of life enjoyment changed sharply when a harpy that had been sent on a special mission returned to Yul directly, blood streaming down his shoulder from what looked like birdshot. Cosmo and company bristled at the knowledge that someone had tried to shoot down their little spy harpy, but it didn't take a huge leap of brain power to figure out who it was. Their little spy was a sparrow harpy, who introduced himself as Chickily, answering the call when Yule requested a flyer with a bit of daredevil in their heart. Chickily was tasked with watching over the veil and keeping track of what was spewed out of it and had been coming back and forth with reports of personnel movements, resources being brought in or taken out, and anything else of note. What had gotten Chickily shot was his attempts to get close enough to talk to some of the local valley elves that were taken from the town just outside the Vale. A small contingent of them had been marched up to the small base the Blue Helmets had built up around the Vale, and were quickly put to work building lookout towers, buildings, and other general labor. Chickaly then had seen the Southern High Elves strutting around the compound and hurling abuse at the Valley Elves, which is what finally drove him to dive down and try to speak to them. Chickaly see many High Elves digging, building, carving wood. Valley Elves all look sad, while High Elves preen and sometimes smack other Elves with sticks. Blue Hats also building things, pull black water from ground, or have black water sent from cave. They put together wagons with big wheels that growl like monsters. Little Vale Village much big now, stretching out and swallowing land around cave. Many people now, and elves. Chickily grimaced as Jacob, or Gruesome as the rest called him, dug out the pellets from his shoulder. Gruesome was a veteran marine corpsman with a scarred face from an IED that retired him. When Gruesome would pluck a little ball of steel out, Yethus would touch the wound and heal it. Chickalee tried to talk to Valley Elves. They sad, scared, told to come or bad things happen. They sleep outside of the fort, on grass. Blue Hats see Chickalee, shout at Chickalee, and then shoot when Chickalee fly away. Yule patted Chickalee's head and then gave his cheek a soft pinch. You done good, Chickalee. Thank you. Pumpa Rum should be proud of such a brave sparrow harpy like you. Chickalee's chest swelled with pride and fire as he grinned up at Yule, and Yule grinned back, before looking over at his NCOs. Domino, who had been promoted to such a Veil Rider rank, flicked a coin off his thumb with a crisp cling, while grinning from ear to ear. Yule clapped his hands together, and Domino caught his coin, the rest of the NCOs sitting up and rolling their shoulders. No stick-wielding goblinoids this time. We're hunting blue helmets, lads. Cosmoline Company whirled into motion as everyone loaded themselves out to the gills with the ammunition they could spare. There were shortages, but there was some help indeed from the special magics that whirled around this realm. The dwarves in particular had a special kind of sack that could duplicate certain things inside of it. Sack was a generous term, though, as it was more like a small coin purse, and getting back ammo was a slow and tedious process, as it took almost a week for the complex chemistry of the bullet to be reproduced. They had, however, pioneered the science of lubricants, which was fantastic news for the health of Cosmoline Company's weapons. A message was sent to Zerg Company, carried defiantly by Chickalee, while well, Yule hired on a female hawk harpy named Eris to stick with them to carry messages. When every Veil Rider had their gear in order and the throng was mustered, all the company elements moved out of the city. This time they had proper wagons and horses, something a lot of the Veil Riders highly enjoyed, including Yule. Like Yule, a lot of the men and women of Cosbling Company were from the South or Midwest and grew up learning how to ride horses. A whopping 30 of the Vale Riders were on horseback, the rest driving or riding in the wagons. 
allowing them to have a wing of dragoons with Yule heading them. Saddles were modified for the carrying of Betty and the other machine guns, but other than that, they were a force that could ride out, deploy, and ambush in quick succession. That same wing of dragoons lay out in the sopping wet grass now, watching down the road that ran from Sanrion to Emil Norse. Yethus looked to Yule, and very slowly raised her head from the ground cover he and her lay behind. What is it? She asked timidly, her voice tight with excitement and fear. Humvees, keep your head down. Yule grabbed her shirt collar with a finger and jerked her head down, while he nodded to Domino across the road in the other ambush position and held up his hand in front of his face, then pointing to Domino. Do you see? Domino gripped his hat brim. I see. Yule made a fist and moved it from side to side, then pointed to his eye. Vehicles. You see? Domino gave him a thumbs up, then held up his three middle fingers, then made an L shape with his hand. I see. Six trucks. Yule made a trigger pull at him with his hand, and then pointed to his eye again. You see infantry. Domino again gave him a thumbs up, held up an O shape with his fist, then another one next to it. He then made an L shape with his pointer finger and thumb, and held it as high as he dared. I see infantry. Twenty. Rifles. Yule held up an okay hand gesture at him, then pointed at his ear, and then to himself. Listen for me. Domino nodded and hunkered down in his cover, looking down his scope. Chicks was next to him, and she slowly chewed a local gum replacement as she stared down her optics. Yule turned to Yethus, speaking in a hushed voice as the trucks drew closer placing his chest against her head so the amulet would activate. Stay low. Don't scream. It's going to get very loud, and a lot of people are going to die. Yethus looked at him wide-eyed before he threw the netting over her to conceal her. Then he began to low-crawl along the side of the road's brush line to the main battery of 240 Bravos and Betty, which stared straight down the road from the curve they lay on. The gunners stared hawkishly down their sights or optics at the oncoming tan Humvees that had a blue UN spray painted on the hoods. Yule thought that odd, and creepy, that they were using US military hardware, but shook the idea from his mind as he crawled up next to his heavy hitters. Turn that first truck into Swiss cheese with Betty. Ding anyone running for it with the 240s. They nodded and Yule crawled on to the rest of the Veil vale Riders hiding in shallow fighting holes and obscured from sight along the brush line. Betty's going to take the first truck, shoot to kill. Any prisoners is just a bonus. Yule clapped Cole on the shoulder as he stepped over him in a low hunch, his boots thudding soppily on the standing water that lay about, and knelt against a wide tree, making sure that he could see Domino on the other side. His K2's buttstock was in his shoulder at a low ready as he slowly leaned his head around the edge of the tree trunk, his hat covered with netting and leaves. He could see the lead Humvee was about 50 yards away, the diesel engine growling as it trundled along at low speeds due to the road being so worn and potholed. Yule looked at Domino, told him to hold fire, then looked at Betty's gunners and made a chopping motion with his hand. There was a pause. A click. Then Betty thumped into action, sending 50 cows shredding down the road and into the front of the lead truck. The concussion from her muzzle sent water flying when a round left the barrel, and steam began to slowly rise from her receiver as water made contact with the heated metal. Tracers from her barrel hissed and danced through the air, metal sparking harshly as the burning round burrowed its way inside the vehicle. The lead truck's pristine front window suddenly had a cluster of holes in it as her aim traversed from high left to low right, the driver being turned into a blood-covered sponge as soon as three rounds made contact with him. His window was cracked to let a bit of air in, and crimson spray flew out of it and onto the road thickly. Yule noticed with curiosity as he lifted his K2 and shot the gunner in the chest from near point-blank range, that there were an awful lot of people in the Humvee. He could tell this from the amount of blood that came pouring out from the bottoms of the light doors that they had on it, there being gaps here and there, and it spilled out onto the road as if it were a can of cherry juice being shot with BB guns. 
The gunner screamed from the round bursting out the back of his chest and lurched forward to grab the 240 Bravo mounted to the gunner ring. Domino stood up sharply and shot once, the entire top skull of the man spattering onto the back of the rear hatch cover, and he thudded lifelessly on top of the machine gun. Chicks fired as well, another gunner in a middle truck screaming out in horror as his heart was turned to mush and blown out of his own shoulder blade. Betty chunked out a few more rounds and went quiet, and soldiers from the other Humvees began to spill out, a scattering of accents flying through the air as they all tried to fall out into the ruts off the side of the road for cover. It was when they were mostly all in the open that the Veil vale Rider's own 240 Bravos thundered in challenge of their big sister, joined by the rhythmic staccato of the rifles cutting men and women down left and right. World War II, Korean. Vietnam and Gulf War rifles sparked to life and shed blood once again after being at rest for so long. Extractors sang as brass flew through the air, their cargo expended into the bodies or doors of the enemy before them. Angry lead shot buzzed and hissed through the air before thudding into flesh and bone. The cries of the stricken and dying echoing off the trees along with the reports of gunfire. The lead truck, never being put in the park where the brake applied, continued to roll forward, turning slightly as it began to rumble towards the ambush lines. Yule stepped forward and signaled for the rest of the rifles to move up, and waved his hand side to side to tell the machine guns to cease fire. As the Veil vale Riders mopped up anyone who kept fighting, Yule opened the door to the lead truck, walking along with it as it reached over to turn the engine selector off. He looked at the driver, who was missing large chunks of meat from his torso, and wrinkled his nose slightly. Gross. Yule leaned in further as the crack and pop of a rifle here or there echoed outside, and saw that there were the remains of an officer in here, along with a roll of papers in the Valley Elf language. The Humvee was also completely packed, Yule seeing that some bodies actually lay dead in the rear compartment, or slumped over the middle divider where the dead gunner's feet dangled. He snatched the scrolls up, spat on the ventilated corpse of the officer, and leaned out of the riddled vehicle. Yethus ran up beside him, sputtering in her language, and Yule dragged out the amulet, touching it to his temple. Hurt, are you hurt? Yule chuckled. <laughs> I'm fine, Yethus. Go check on the others. Yethus trotted off, yelling and waving her hand at the other Veil vale Riders. Gremlin and Domino came trotting up to him, and the three walked down the road. One survivor, German female. She took a 5.56 five, to the leg and went down, then hid behind the wheels of her truck. Domino pointed her out, currently pinned to the ground with a knee in her back and getting her hands tied with the rope. Lots of fuel in these heaps, Gremlin piped up, patting an almost pristine hum via that just had a hole or two where the gunner was mowed down. Should keep my jennies running for a while. And ammo and food, Yule murmured looking in the rear of the truck and seeing stacks of ammo cans. Overall, 31 blue helmets were gunned down in the road, with no losses to the Veil vale Riders' first dragoons. While the lead truck was a mess, the other trucks were in usable condition, and toting a lot of hardware to boot. For one reason or another, these trucks were loaded down with almost two weeks worth of food and ammo, as well as explosives and detonators. Yule held up the amulet to his temple and yelled up into the sky. Eris, ma'am, I need you. Eris flitted down from a tree nearby, having watched the show, and landed neatly on the back of a dead blue helmet before Yule. She lifted her chin to him, her claws digging into the bleeding flesh of the cooling corpse. Could you please go tell Coco that the ambush was a success? We have vehicles and more ammo if he needs them. Eris hears. She purred, and then opened her wings wide beating them until she was clear into the sky and heading east. Yule watched her go, making sure no one was going to try and shoot her down from some unknown location, before he moved on down the road. The rain still hammered down onto the ground, and red trails of crimson spidered here and there from the bodies that lay in the rough gravel and dirt of the road. Judging from their shocked and surprised faces, they never expected the Veil vale Riders to even be here. Ooga booga murmured Yule, as he kicked one of their blue helmets into the brush. 
The Veil vale Riders were stripping bodies of ammo and anything else of use, and tossing them into the Humvees, while a growing stack of weapons was in the rear trunk of another. Little ceremony was given to the bodies, just being chucked off the side of the road to clear it. Those who knew how were already moving the Humvees and driving them back towards where their horses were staked, and they rumbled by as Yule knelt down in front of their only captive. Gruesome had already yanked out the slug, and yet this had healed the wound. She was definitely German. Her jaw was strong, with chestnut brown hair and brown eyes that glimmered with little sparks of honey here and there. Her face was contorted in both fury and fear as she craned her neck to and fro, the rain spattering off her face and off those around her. Veil vale Rider stood near and about her, squatting down while smoking local vices or cleaning the blood from their knives on the bodies of her dead comrade. The one thing they all shared was a resentful look that was cast down upon her, and panic began to crawl up her neck in a red flush. Yule knelt down in front of her, the buttstock of his K2 splashing onto the ground as he used it for support. He took a moment to take out his well-worn and chewed corn cob pipe and tucked it into his mouth clenching it with his teeth as he gave her the grin that all predators have when the hunt has gone well. Hello, Liebling. Willkommen auf die Schleie. And that's the end of this particular chapter of the Veil vale Riders. Now, I know I fucked up last week, but I'm going to try and get at least two chapters out this week. If I don't, I'm going to dumb baby jail. I'm going to stay there. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for stopping by and listening to my little story. If you liked it, be sure to like and subscribe to Garbiria and click the bell icon so you know when the next upload is going to be coming up. Additionally, I'll be doing more videos over at Neckbeardia as well and all kinds of fun stuff like that. This has been Garbro and I will see y'all next time.